Our next speaker will be talking about Comcast SpeechNet, weekly supervised end-to-end -end speech recognition at industrial stage. Please join me in welcoming to the stage lead research scientist at Comcast Applied AI, Raphael Tank. Hey, Raphael. Hey. You mentioned, uh, before you start, sorry, you mentioned you were like both cats and snakes, which I thought was a very unique combo. So do you keep <laughs> either as pets? Or are they compatible at all? Uh, I don't have a snake yet, but I like snakes. Um, I have a cat. Uh, she's a three-year-old Siberian. Um, and uh, yeah. Nice. Well, thanks for sharing. Um, and excited for your talk as well. So over to you, Raphael. All right. Thanks for that. Um, so I'll share my screen. <clears throat> so the problem statement for Comcast SpeechNet uh, is that um, automatic speech recognition systems are costly to develop and slow to run. And uh, at least this work you know, happened before the re release of Whisper, which is great in the general setting. So when we talk about costly to develop, we're really talking about um, you know, the specialized uh, domain. So for a particular domain um, where we have you know, maybe specific words or rare words or unseen words, um, that's uh, something that Whisper or some general AI search system wouldn't be able to handle um, that well. Um, so again, um, commercial ASR systems take hundreds, if not thousands of hours of speech to train. Um, so uh, we're looking at, you know, a lot of uh, speech transcript data where we have thousands of hours of labeled speech. Um, so it's like speech utterances and the textual transcripts uh, of the utterance. And manual annotation services such as Rev uh, cost $90 per hour of transcribed speech. And, um, you know, everything considered, our in-house annotators actually cost more than that. So like a lot of that is social coordination. A lot of that is um, you know beyond uh, beyond like salaries, also like project management. So um, these models, which are usually you know large pre-trained transformers, as is typical, uh, additionally need increasing amounts of computation. So um, without model acceleration, our GPU fleet of T4s. Uh, though, so that's an older um, GPU from a few uh, years ago. Um, they can't handle these large models as effectively, um, at least as some of the newer, like A10s, uh, for example. Um, and again, uh, so these are basically two hurdles, right? So this is a two-pronged uh, problem uh, statement. We want to uh, train and run these end-to-end -end, um, automatic speech recognition systems. It's both labor and computation intensive. So these two hurdles impede effective model deployments at all but really the largest uh, technology companies. Um, so our industrial challenge for Comcast is to fine tune and deploy way to vec 2.0, a large transformer without an army of annotators or you know, really large GPU farms. So our end application is the X Xfinity X1. That's a voice enabled smart television serving millions of devices in the US. Uh, so, you know, a bit of an um, introduction to some of our products that we're serving. So first is the Xfinity X1. That's um, a bit of an older uh, version of the voice remote. Uh, so this is a remote that you use to control your smart TV. Um, this is all in the context of, you know, entertainment systems, smart entertainment, smart entertainment systems for the television. Uh, how you use this is you hold down the voice, um, the microphone button here, and you issue your voice command, and then you're able to interact with your TV through that. And next is uh, Xfinity Flex, so that's a newer offering. Um, and then finally, we also have uh, Sky Glass. So Sky is our European subsidiary. subsidiary. Uh, they're the largest cable operator in Europe, um, and they have like an all-in-one uh, smart television that um, customers are able to interact with using their voice. So um, the main contributions of this work are as follows. So first, we derive novel snorkel labeling functions for constructing weekly labeled speech data sets from in-production ASR systems. Uh, we improve um, you know, our best model without labeling functions by relative 8% in word error rate, which is quite a bit. Um, and then we also propose to accelerate model inference using a pool of CUDA graphs. We attain a seven to nine times inference speed increase at no quality loss. And finally, we're the first to describe a large scale weight vec based deployment in the academic literature. Like this uh, work was published at EMLP 2022 uh, the, as part of the industry track. Our resulting speech uh, system, SpeechNet, currently serves more than 20 million queries per day on the Xfinity X1. So that's our television, smart television platform. So the TLDR is that we use data programming and CUDA graph pools to effectively uh, serve wave to vec 2.0 to millions of customers. Our SpeechNet approach is, uh, it breaks down as follows. Uh, so first uh, we have ASR modeling and uh, for this component, again, we use wave effect 2.0. That's a large pre-trained pre uh, state-of-the-art transformer model. 
Um, and uh, second, we use data curation. So we curate a weekly supervised ASR data sets. So this is for training purposes um, by leveraging implicit user feedback. So that's um, basically like uh, non-servable features uh, such as how the user behaved during the session um, after the session ended, um, you know, what the position of the voice query was. And, you know, we'll, we'll do a deep dive into some of these uh, implicit user signals um, later on. Um, and uh, thirdly is model acceleration. So we accelerate our model at inference time using CUDAGRAPH pools. And again, we'll also talk about that. So it's a three component approach. Um, so first is uh, in end-to-end -end ASR models, just a bit of background, we transcribe speech waveform directly to orthography. And like NLP, the dominant paradigm in speech processing is to pre-train transformers on you know, lots of hours of unlabeled speech using some contrastive unsupervised objective. And then we fine tune that model on thousands of hours of labeled speech. And then we have some you know, references below here uh, for further reading. Um, and a representative state save the art approach is a 94 million parameter wave effect 2.0 base model. I, I mean, again, this work was done before Whisper. So nowadays it would probably be uh, Whisper um, and uh, for in the multilingual setting, maybe MMS. So uh, we instantiate our model from the official checkpoint that's fine tuned on the 960 hour library speech data set. So it's an open um, speech data set, English speech data set. And next we can talk about you know, data curation. Um, so the problem is that well, wave effect 2.0 base still requires thousands of hours of labeled speech to adapt to our voice queries. Um, so we should, let's use a third party. The idea here is to use a third party ASR system to propose transcripts for the data. And um, and yeah, so we again like since it's a, it's a third party ASR system, there's it's bound to have a lot of incorrect transcripts. And what we do to filter out these wrong transcripts is to um, use signals from uh, implicit user feedback and behavior. Uh, and this is where Sorrel comes into play. We previously observed and derived some of these signals in our um, prior published uh, work. So first is session position. So voice queries that are last of the viewing session are likely to be accurately uh, transcribed. And that's pretty uh, intuitive because uh, if the user got to what they want, they're not likely to issue another voice query. They'll be watching a television show, right? So second is ASR confidence. So transcripts with high confidence scores from the ASR system are likely to be accurate. And this follows, uh, again, pretty um, logically. Third is rapid repetition. And uh, this is kind of linked to the first where, you know, if a query is rapidly repeated, then it's likely to be uh, mistranscribed. And again, we also observed this um, in some previous published work. Uh, and the idea here is that, um, well, let's use these signals and combine them as labeling functions in Snorkel to uh, basically say, well, is a data point, should we toss out a transcript or should we use a transcript to that the third party ASR system proposed? So, so yeah, um, let's talk about some of these limiting functions in depth. So first is session position. We group queries as part of the same session if they're within 60 seconds of one another. So this is kind of like, um, this is kind of what we're doing in web search. Uh, so previously we found a negative correlation between the intercession position of a query and the word error rate. So again, the transfer is likely right to the user got to what they wanted and started watching for a while, right? So this can be um, captured by this limiting function. We label as correct if Q is the query Q is last in the session and incorrect if the session length is you know, pretty long and Q is not the last uh, query and we abstain otherwise because we're not confident in whether it's correct or incorrect. And this is just based on some uh, pilot studies, some empirical you know, analysis. Um, and the second component is ASR, the second, so the second labeling function is ASR confidence. So we use the confidence score from our third party ASR system. And uh, in the past, researchers have shown that this score correlates well with transcript quality. Um, however, um, what we notice is that text can be a, the text can be a confounder. So for example, infrequent words can just automatically result in lower scores because, um, because they're just infrequent. You know, there's a language modeling component as part of a lot of these ASR systems. So um, what we did is that we kind of grouped the thresholds uh, by query text. Uh, we uh, use thresholds that are specific for, um, you know, for, for queries. And uh, if the confidence uh, for that particular query, so uh, for example, for CNN, for Hulu, uh, maybe the confidence threshold is going to be lower. And then for something that's more rare, it might be higher, right? So uh, we mark that as, um, we mark it as incorrect, you know, if it's within the 80th percentile, and then we mark it as incorrect if it's lower than the 20th percentile. And then we abstain, you know, otherwise, because we're just not confident in that label. And yeah. And then finally, we have um, uh, rapid repetition. So previously, we found that users rapidly repeat their queries upon ASR mistranscription. And this is unsurprising since our UI is heavily voice dependent. Um, so users would rapidly repeat their queries if they just see a mistranscription. And given this, we can, describe, we can discard queries that closely precede others from the same user. And to determine how close, well, we perform grid search and we arrive at 13 seconds. So if the user's 
next query occurs less than or equal to 13 seconds of the current query, then that's probably going to be uh, the current query is probably incorrect. And then we have to say otherwise because we don't really have a good signal for uh, whether the query was correct as far as the signal goes. So um, yeah, so we take these three labeling functions and we combine them in Snorkel. Uh, and that's, you know, as we all know, a framework for automatically denoising the outputs a lot of these for a lot of these uh, weak labelers into one's high quality outputs. And we gather session data and speech clips from our customers and transcripts from the third party ESR system. So this, we're kind of using a third party to bootstrap, you know, a lot of these, um, a lot of the initial uh, queries uh, training data just because for constructing the training sets. So here's just an example of uh, Netflix, um, just an example of someone saying Netflix and some session information being combined in Snorkel. Um, the first limiting function outputted uh, gave abstain, the second gave uh, correct, and the last one outputs incorrect, and then Snorkel denoised that and arrived at a judgment of incorrect. And then since it's incorrect, we would not use this as a data point for constructing the training sets. And finally, um, our last component is um, we use uh, some model acceleration methods. We use codograph pools to speed up the model. So in production, we use a batch size of one for inference, which largely decreases efficiency since GBA kernel launches now dominate processing time. Uh, and if you look at the left figure below, this is kind of an illustration of conventional inference. We have a sequence of kernel launches, um, you know, and th there's some time spent, um, you know, in the red area, that's uh, the kernel launch delay. Um, and it kind of adds up over time. Um, and to improve efficiency, what codographs do is that they initialize uh, and record a sequence of consecutive GPU launches. They store them as a computation graph, and then they execute inputs of the same shape while incurring only a single launch operation. So it basically takes all these kernel launches, it's able to chain them together, um, and then we do have some, we still have some kernel launch latency, but overall it greatly accelerates, um, you know, inference for a large range of models. Um, however, the problem statement here is that while well, codographs only work with fixed length input, which is an obstacle for us since our queries are variable length, we also can't simply path to a large fixed size since our computation increases quadratically with length. I mean, that's just a side effect that's kind of a um, consequence of using transformers. Uh, for the most part, uh, at least vanilla transformers um, have computation that increases quadratically with uh, the length. So what we do is we propose to maintain a pool of codographs each initialized to a different length, and then we route queries to the nearest upper bound graph in the pool at inference time. So we initialize the, the, the distribution of this CUDA graph pool to the observed length distribution in production, which is a log normal uh, distribution in production. So this is just an illustration of three queries being routed to three different, um, differently sized graphs um, you know, in the CUDA graph pool. So now we have some experiments to kind of um, to validate our um, approaches. So first is we curate two data sets, a small one with human annotations and a large one without any human annotations. And our small data set called CC20 comprises 20, just 20 keywords and 40,000, 48,000 examples. And this lets us assess how speech does relative to using human label data. So how close does Snorkel come to, uh, how close does it come to um, basically human label data, you know, given, given that. Um, and our large data set called CCLG comprises 1400 hours of speech uh, from the excellent entertainment system. And we annotate a few, uh, like uh, we annotate a few hours of speech just for the evaluation sets. So the dev and test sets. Um, and that's just to validate, you know, that um, our performance, our quality. And we also pick two baselines um, for the modeling. So each of them also represent the state of the art at that model size. So we'll, our first small model is SEW tiny, SU tiny consisting of 41 million parameters. And our large model, large model is conformer large, and that's 120 million parameters. And this is just to explore like some of the model space to, um, to validate our choice of way to vec 2.0 base. Um, and these are the quality results uh, on um, so we have the models uh, as the first column. We have CU tiny, weight to vector point zero base, and conformer large. And then the second is uh, the second column breaks it down by um, the training set. So we have the raw training data, which is uh, without snorkel, and then we have the weak uh, training set, which is with snorkel, and we have the human uh, training set, uh, which is um, you know annotated by humans. Uh, so for CC tiny, we have these uh, fixed dev and test sets. So these are just some dev and test sets that we already annotated, um, you know, by hand. And then CCLG is also, uh, you know, this counterpart for the larger data sets. And what we saw here, well, these numbers are word error rates. So the lower is uh, low, the lower um, low rates are better. Low, the lower the better here. And what we saw for CC20 is that um, the main takeaway is that wave vec 2.0 base is uh, actually does best, even though it has fewer parameters than conformer large, and um, and of course it has more parameters than SCW tiny. Uh, it achieves a word error rate of 1.54 on the dev test and 1.75 on the test set uh, for CC20. And the second takeaway is that while well, Snorkel actually comes really close 
So snorkel um, for all these models, uh, and in particular for wave to vector point zero base, uh, comes within just 0 0.08 uh, word error rate points. So it's basically equivalent to using you know human annotated data. So that's quite that's quite promising. That's quite good. Um, and for CC large, we're also able to um, attain the best um, the best quality using snorkel. Uh, we don't have access to human annotated data just because you know that's like we discussed that's really um that requires a lot of resources to annotate um so so yeah that's pretty promising as far as you know the quality goes and you know just to validate our labeling functions what we did well we also ran a small um, ablation study on um on applying like these labeling functions consecutively like one on top of the other one after the other so first is just using the session position it's able, we're able to see some gains there and then you know after we apply the second labeling function of uh, of confidence scores uh, that also improves a little bit, and then with uh, rapid repetition, that labeling function also improves that um, you know a little bit more. So that that kind of breaks it down by um, you know how uh, it's just to validate uh, that the you know three labeling functions is better than one. So uh, and finally, we have some efficiency efficiency results, and we're able to see here uh, on the left side we have latency. So higher numbers are worse. Uh, and then we also broke it down by, um, by the models. Uh, we also, we applied CUDA graphs, uh, you know, uniformly initialized and a CUDA graph pool that's log normally initialized. And we also have no graphs at all. And since the left side, the y-axis is a log scale, um, this is actually a seven to nine times um, improvement for wave to vec 2.0. The wave to um, the green one, the log norm one is the best. Uh, that's about a seven times improvement. And SCW, it looks like it's about a nine times improvement for log normal scale. Um, and then on the right side, we have throughput. So we don't care just about latency. We, we care about latency and throughput, um, you know, most importantly. Uh, and for throughput, the higher num higher numbers are better. Um, and then the blue line here is kind of our requirements. Um, and we see that, well, we basically see like a three, two to three times improvement in throughput that we affect 2.0 is able to handle. And the conformer one is the most drastic, probably because conformers uh, have more kernel launches. I mean, that, that's, the, um, that's the guess there. That's the conjecture there. So, um, so yeah, the efficiency results are, you know, quite promising. Um, and then thirdly, we also ran some, you know, basic ablation studies on uh, the number of graphs and the number of threads. And, you know, as we see um, for the number of graphs for the x-axis, you know, versus the latency on the y-axis, um, and then uh, also the QPS on the right side, uh, the latency um, decreases pretty drastically. Um, it definitely has diminishing returns past 10 graphs or 20 graphs or so. Um, and uh, on the right side, we actually see for the number of threads, uh, probably due to thread contention, um, as we increase the number of threads, um, it does, uh, you know, um, uh, it does decrease the uh, QPS uh, throughput, that is the queries per second. And then for latency, it increases that uh, linearly. Um, yeah. So three is the magic number here. Um, so, so, yeah. And um, yeah, that concludes uh, this presentation. Uh, and thanks for watching. Um, and if you want to reach out and contact us, here's my email and website. And then my manager is for uh, that's his email. And then if you're interested in comic as applied AI in general, that's the org that I'm a part of, uh, there's our websites. So, yeah. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Raphael. Um, very interesting, uh, to hear how, you know, you're using snorkel and labeling functions, et cetera, in the speech domain, which is something that we hadn't heard before. So thank you for giving us a glimpse into that. Um, there's a lot of questions coming in, so I'll start from the top. So um, Alexi asks, how do you, like, do you use on-device models? So I guess the models that you were talking about, is it on-device or is it hosted somewhere? So these are cloud uh, models. So way to vec 2.0, uh, we base, we host in a, a fleet of T4s uh, in some Docker uh, Swarm configuration. Um, so we are looking into on-device models. Um, you know, some teams, at least uh, they said they were, and I think it would definitely be interesting. You know, I think that would be an interesting direction. <clears throat> so is the latency acceptable as of now, which, which seems like it is, and that's why you, you're not right. really eager to try the on-device. Right, yeah, it is It is acceptable. Um, and I guess our, our devices are not uh, powerful enough to run a lot of these systems. So the set-top box is actually pretty, uh, the specs are pretty uh, minimal. Um, mm -hmm. which I think makes sense um, given the deployments and given the cost structure. Uh, like just a bit of a, just some more uh, background. Uh, we can look at the latency distribution. Uh, so before uh, the orange line is the P50 latency is what we had before. And then the red is what we have now. So we're able to decrease that by uh, about 30% uh, or so. 
uh, and likewise for the P80, uh, sorry, this orange line is a P80 and then the P50 is the blue line and the green line. So that's before and after, you know, speech nets. Got it. Okay. Amazing. Thanks. Um, so uh, sort of on a different direction. Um, question. Uh, spoken words are not pre-processed nor features extracted. Okay. I think the question, you can see them in the Q&A tab as well if you want to see the raw question. Oh, but my okay. interpretation of this is they're asking about like, are you doing some sort of like feature engineering around spoken words? Um, mm. I don't know what MFCC is. Maybe you oh, do, I but see. like, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so MFCCs, um, I, I guess in the past, MFCCs um, were, you know, it would be part of the state of the art uh, pipeline. Uh, like basically they would be converted to MFCCs and you, you'll probably run a deep model or um, mm. even before a deep, a deep learning, that would be HMMs. Um, so nowadays it's uh, end to end models go from the speech waveform directly. Uh, so the raw um, acoustic um, amplitudes directly to the orthography. And that's, uh, so wave to vec 2.0 would have that, um, you know, processing stack. It would have like basically that feature extractor would, the feature extractor would be learned end to end from the raw audio waveform. Got it. So similarly, so, like we did for text and images, like instead of doing sort of all that feature engineering that we used to do before and then converting to the vector, you just kind of do like the word directly. Um, right. Process it directly. Okay. Makes right, sense. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Um, Carl asks, um, impressive to see that the three labeling functions are leading to higher performance compared to human annotation. Did you consider other labeling functions beyond the three that you landed on? So uh, we have not really looked past those three labeling functions, but just because it came really close to human um, quality. Uh, so it was like, um, since it was basically more or less, you know, human parity, we we thought it was uh, it was lower priority to continue exploring, like to building out more labeling functions. But I could see like more being helpful. Um, I think some of the adheres definitely have, you know, more ideas surrounding that. Makes sense. And you mentioned that this is already sort of performing well. So how do you decide what the acceptable performance threshold is for, for these sort of models uh, before deploying? Does that come from the business? Does that just come from like, okay, this seems good enough based on industry standards? Yeah, it comes from a discussion between um, us and product and some of senior leadership. Um, it for, for this case, uh, we we looked at how we were doing versus our third party. So that kind of wasn't captured, you know, here in this presentation, but the teal deer is that we we outperformed our third party uh, in terms of speed, um, so uh, and quality and also uh, cost. So we basically beat them on all the three important uh, business metrics. <clears throat> that's amazing. Uh, and it's built in house. So you kind of own the model and, and all of that right. as well. So that's awesome. Right. Um, great. You also mentioned Whisper a few times. So have you played around with it? Has it changed anything in your modeling approaches? Whisper. Um, so this work was done before Whisper, and recently we are playing with us with Whisper. And I think what we some of the path forward there is what we want to um, basically replace Wave to Back 2.0 with Whisper, um, and then just see how that does. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, out of, well, we also want to look it out of the box, right? Um, what we're currently seeing is that it's not doing as well on short utterances. It's actually kind of better on long utterances. And on some of the rare words that it just wasn't able to, it just wasn't trained on, it's not doing as well. Like part of that, I guess, is text normalization where maybe it outputs something that's sane, but it's not something that uh, makes sense for us. So for example, like Disney plus, maybe that the plus sign should be a, you know, it should be a plus sign instead of the word plus, right? right? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, whisper, you know, that's also, that's an area that we're working on. Um, definitely interesting. Makes sense. On that note, like the Disney plus example that you gave, um, there are probably like, you know, shows that come up and like other platforms or like specific names that if you knew that that was the name of a TV show, you could transcribe correctly or things like that, right, or, you exactly. know, get correctly. How do you incorporate that sort of knowledge of like, you know, this is a show and, and things like that into all of these modeling approaches? So something we're looking into is um, actually using um, like our caption data. So we have a lot of TV captions, um, like these are actually uh, mm -hmm. can typed. Uh, so if we're able to use that audio effectively, um, you know, that's still an open question that we're looking into. Um, and that should hopefully like, for example, if we use news data and then people mm -hmm. consistently type like Disney plus or some other uh, new words and rare and unseen words, we can automatically use those transcripts and you know, those um, utterances. Got it. Makes sense. Um, are you currently like measuring how the model does on these different subsets of data? Like, let's say, you know, names of shows versus like general utterances. And you, you mentioned comparing short versus long ones. So do you sort of um, create various subsets of your test sets or things like that? 
Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, so uh, one of the things we looked at was, um, so instead of looking at just word error rate, we also looked at something um, that was closer to like micro word error rate. So that was split by word. So that, that'll that reflect the rare entities better. Hmm. We also looked at, um, you know, uh, transcripts that are not in the top, like 15,000, you know, 20,000 uh, commands. Um, so, so yeah, it, it is part of the uh, analysis. Makes sense. Um, and then maybe last question, I guess, what's next for you? Any other ways that you're experimenting with Snorkel or just other techniques? With Snorkel, um, not so much in terms of labeling functions, but I know there's some uh, new development surrounding like a fine tuning API, like some fine tuning um, framework that I know Snorkel is putting together. And I think that's something that's great to explore. Um, like right now I'm looking into customer care, for example, like large language models for customer care. And I think that would be great to explore. So like outside of labeling functions, um, with Snorkel in general, I think, you know, there's, there are definitely things to explore. And actually, maybe one last question since we do have a little bit of time. Um, for people that may not be very familiar with the speech domain, right? Like I think we have a lot of people who are from NLP potentially. So what are the trade-offs or considerations where, you know, in this case, you're training like directly a speech model instead of like transcribing to text and then um, sort of applying like an NLP model. So what are some of the things to consider where, where like you may want to transcribe the text and then use an NLP model versus direct speech model? Is it always better to just directly use like a speech model to work with speech or how do you think about that? Yeah, that's a good question. So my field of expertise is uh, definitely in ASR, uh, like it's not exactly in speech language understanding. So mm. not going from speech to intent directly. Um, so, so yeah, it, I think, I think there, like, I think a lot of the same arguments for, you know, why people pick end-to-end -end systems would apply. So for example, maybe the compound compounding errors would be reduced. Like the errors mm. would just be, you know, directly from speech to intent. Uh, we would have a single end-to-end -end model that we're able to optimize. Right. Right. Um, they're definitely, I, I'm, I'm guessing like they're, there are arguments there that would apply. Um, but our current pipeline is basically, well, we have SpeechNet and then we have, um, you know, the typical uh, speech to, uh, or rather uh, text to intent. So some uh, logical form model uh, on top of that to transcribe, to turn, uh, to basically understand um, uh, the text and the user's intent. Uh, so, so yeah, but I think SLU, like that is something worth uh, looking into for sure. <clears throat> that makes sense. And I thought it was interesting that you are training these speech models, but then it's really expensive to have people listen to the speech and sit there. So it might be easier to take the transcribed text and as you did, filter it to the right subset and use the NLP techniques to label the data, but then train that train like a speech model on top of, you know, that sort of labeling. So I thought that was very, very interesting. Mm -hmm.